good morning everyone so uh, this session on uh, topography will involve multiple devices pentacam galilee and citus which are the most commonly used and uh, we all know that in india we use different uh, topographers it's not that everybody has pentacam uh, a predominant a large number of people in india use uh, citus and uh, a smaller number use galilee and uh, so each of these devices have a different principle based on which they derive their indices and how to interpret each of these indices is is something of uh, real concern and as far as pentagram is concerned uh, we have uh, uh, dr belin the man who uh, is behind all the indices and these newer advancements in pentagram so he'll be explaining to us uh, about those things and how to interpret them in different scenarios and with respect to cirrus those indices that we have uh, even the names are sometimes difficult to pronounce uh, the indices in cirrus and uh, many of the uh, refractive surgeons in india use them uh, arbitrarily so we'll try and uh, make some uh, give a guideline on how to use these indices and uh, different indices have a different sensitivity and specificity with respect to pentacam galilee and cirrus so we'll also have a broad outlook into uh, which indices should be looked into when we are for example trying to look for a suspect trying to look for an early keratoconus with respect to pentacam galilee and cirrus so we'll start off we'll start with the pentacam and uh, i'll describe this case uh, you can play the case please whitish can stand on the other side dr whitish was my fellow uh, he finished recently and uh, I, i would like to acknowledge is one of the best uh, understanding in topography i ever come across in fact the uh, entire videos on cirrus or galilei the foundation of it is very strong so i thought he should be the one who should drive this uh, talk so professor belin would you like to start off with the pentacam now <coughs> first question is do we have any clinical history what are we sir do we have any clinical his history uh, this is a patient uh, who's come to me for refractive uh, correction uh let's take it as refractive error as uh, minus 2 and 1.5 diopters of uh, cylinder a diopter of cylinder and uh, you look at the elevation maps and i'll i'll give you the bad deeds and little later okay so the first or you want you want both the maps together for you excuse me you want the other maps also yes uh, you, can I'll you play the bad deed also I'll for this i'll tell you why as as we change it uh, mike 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 okay sorry this is your bad deed. Okay. So the reason I asked for that to be changed not so much that I'm used to looking at that which I am, but because one of the things we did when we designed that is we fixed the colors and we fixed the scales. So without having to look at the numbers which some of us can't read that you it is very quick for me to look at these. If you go back to the one you had before if we can go the back to it. What? So the elevation maps are using uh, and the pentacam it's called the american it's really the oculus scales. Uh, sorry, the uh, orbiscan scales. And you can see a totally different appearance. So if you're using different scales and different colors, you really have to then pay attention to to the numbers which is time consuming. But I have a question for you. I mean, uh, all the uses here are uses of one of these technologies I'll let come to you even though the scan is not of great quality. uh this galilei one you when when you look at it you know that there's something abnormal in the curvature there's something abnormal in your back and and anterior elevation but why do you think the machines bad d and other indices absolutely is looking normal can you go to the next slide next uh, go to the bad d please why is it showing as 0.1.16 and all your other indices are so normal because if you look at the let's look at the anterior ele elevation it's not an abnormal pattern it's a displaced pattern and a displaced pattern will give you an abnormalities on a curvature map and i'll show this later in or i can show it on later on some slides but that that is not grossly abnormal it is when we say abnormal meaning it may not be within 95% but it doesn't mean it's a pathologic shape it's it's a normal astigmatic pattern that's the equi the equivalent of a displaced apex 
and this one is actually displaced up upwards. So this is a 560 corneas, minus 3, minus 1, minus 3 diopters and minus 1 cylinder. So with this cornea, you would do a LASIK surgery? Um, just based on the map, without anything else on the, on the patient, the age or anything else, I would not have concern. But I would also, I will never answer that without looking at the other eye. You would like to differ or agree to this? Well, the fir <clears throat> first thing, I'd love to see the, uh, and the axial curvature map. I'd like to see Can you the go to the axial chain. curvature map, please? No, just, no, just on here. Just, oh. No, 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 no stay there. It. Stay there, but just change the scale. It says quarter diopter relative, I believe. Change it to fixed. No, no, <clears throat> go back. Click it again. <clears throat> to the, no, the little white box there, you, no. <laughs> Click it again. While they're doing that, Brad, I, and that's, you're doing exactly what I said, and that's, if, you're not, you, if you have constantly changing scales, you can't interpret it. And that's what you're asking for is a fixed, something you're used to looking at. Right. So click that again, but, and then stop. See, nope, stop, 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 stop. You see the little white box, the drop down box that you have to click there? Would you like to try it yourself? Yep. So it makes it easy? <clears throat> yep. So by the time he's trying whitish, what do you think uh, the cirrus shows in the same patient? For people using cirrus, so, uh, if you look at the Cirrus map, uh, the main indices that we look for are uh, the SIF, SIB, KVF, KVB, BCV, and the shape indices. I think so this is one of the biggest challenges of Cirrus is to remember these uh, uh, terminologies. And if they make something little better, like BCVF, I mean, the entire terminology is very confusing. The question here is, uh, uh, you know, for the time of interest, which are the most, most important indices you want to really study? So the first index that I would look for is SIF in any map. So See, uh, one minute. Can we just uh, put this uh, cirrus here so that this scalula is, this scan anyway is not great, so that it, everybody can see because it's at the corner. So we, let's keep it in the center. So in the meantime, I can uh, tell for the audience that SIF is basically the difference in the tangential curvature for the anterior or the posterior surface within the superior 1.5 and the inferior 1.5 millimeter zone. So for example, you look and at yes. SIF, SIF is a difference in the average tangential curvature values between the superior 1.5 millimeter zone and the inferior 1.5 millimeter zone centered on the pupil. So if you have, for example, on this map, which is the tangential anterior, you find values of 41.8 anteriorly, uh, superiorly, and 43.36 inferiorly. So, uh, when we see the map, we can look at only one value. But what SIF does is, it takes, it averages, it averages the values. Use the cursor, you sit here only and explain, because it's, it's very difficult. Can we have a map? Yeah, but he, uh, Brad wanted to say something about this map. No, it's, SIF is based on the tangential map. So, if you look at the values here, so you find values of 41.99 and 42.43. As you come inferiorly, you find values of 43.27, 43.36. So, this area which is centered here, if you find a 1.5 millimeter zone superiorly and a 1.5 millimeter zone inferiorly, and average the tangential curvature keratometry values and subtract from the inferior, you subtract the superior. So if you find, basically keratoconus has inferior superior asymmetry which, which has an early inferior, uh, inferior, uh, inferior steepening is the early finding in keratoconus. So if you find that inferior is steeper, your SIF value which is mentioned here turns positive. And so I there I are cutoffs. I, I have a question for you. And I will, I will disagree with that, not that what you're saying, but my guess will be if you turn the pentacam on to the topometric keratoconus staging, which gives you the TKC, you'll see it will be abnormal and it's a false positive. And if you can flip my screen onto the, if you can put my computer on the screen, I'll show you an example. We just finish this case and yeah. then we'll go to your thing. Basically, one important question we want to ask uh, Vaitesh here, uh, then we move to uh, Professor Randleman is, there is a post elevation on, uh, on Pentacam there. The big question everybody asks and always a confusion is, how do you check for post elevation on a cirrus? 
because it's just not like pentagram. You put a cursor, there's an elevation, you don't talk about elevation. So if you can just go there quickly on this, because this is a great case because you have the same patient here. Yeah. So instead of the best fit spear which is used in pentacam, what we use in Cirrus is a best fit Tori case spear. So unlike in a best fit sphere when you look at individual points on the pentacam, you will be able to find the elevation in microns. But what you find when I click, when I place my cursor over here on uh, the anterior post elevation maps is a value called delta Z. So delta Z basically is the aberration difference. So you have a best fit Tori case sphere uh, of a known asphericity and aberrations and compared to that surface, how much is the aberrations different, these are Nikkei uh, aberrations different in, in different points. So unlike you have cutoffs of say 12, 15 or 19 or uh, such values for anterior and posterior elevation in pentacam, the values of delta Z do not have a specific cutoff. But if you have to interpret looking at, if you have to have a cutoff based on the elevation values alone, you will have to look at KVF and KVB. So KVF is the steepest, is the most elevated point on the anterior, based on the anterior uh, best fit toric sphere and be, uh, based on the be, uh, posterior best fit toric sphere the the most elevated point is the kvb so the cutoffs of 7 and 12 have been given for kvf and kvb and but it's not a really strict cutoff it's it's used as a rough guideline so here we find that kvb is more than 12 which is which uh, shows a, a red light or an yellow light saying that uh, it's suspicious so, so unlike pentacam you do not have strict cutoff values based on the points that you see in the posterior and anterior elevation maps they are based on the KVF and KVB, but you can still look for symmetry ha as how you look in pentacam. So, Professor Randleman, you want to comment on this topic? Uh, yeah, well, I, <coughs> so I use the fixed scale um, because it's fixed, meaning every time that certain color of green is going to be the same green, and it, it facilitates looking at the anterior curvature. This one is not overly... Uh, concerning to me based on the, the curvature. I would like to see one other map. I'd like to see just the overview um, on the Pinacam. Can you go to the overview? So it's hard. To <coughs> it, it looks like the patient is looking uh, correctly and it's centered. So uh, it, it may be simply displaced. Um, the other thing I would like to see, and, and one, one thing that I'm utilizing quite a bit in my practice, is epithelial thickness mapping. Uh, um, we, we have the epithelial thickness mapping for this. I don't know whether I put it here, but it's normal. My it's suspicion would have been that just slightly thicker inferiorly. It doesn't have to be much different, but... Um, but what would you do in this patient? So how old is this patient? Uh, 28. Uh, what? Would it differ if the patient is 28 versus 35? Yes, it would for me. Um, I, I certainly want to re-image and, and, and watch. You're also comparing tangential curvature on one versus uh, axial curvature on the other. And so those are going to look slightly different. Um, but would you like, if you feel, if the patient comes back to you again with the same kind of a picture a year later, would you do a LASIK? or a PRK? So that depends, the, the first thing is whether, that depends on whether or not you feel that those are biomechanically different, and I, I do. <clears throat> I feel LASIK and PRK are different. Um, the second thing is if you feel that in your region, in your practice, you get similar results for the two. I, I do. Um, in the United States, we don't, we certainly have haze, but we don't battle it nearly like some other areas of, of the world. So for me, I would probably do a PRK because I see very little downside and I do see upside for it. Dr. Rob, yeah. Yeah, so can we, on the Pentacam, can you switch to the, it's called topometric keratoconus staging? Dr. Ram Murthy, sir, you want to comment on this topography? Okay, so if you look down at the lower, lower line, the second box, it says in indices, you notice the IHD is red and the TKC shows a yellow, which is what I said. That's going to show an abnormality because it's based on anterior surface. It's, it's really there to mimic what you get on a placebo, and it's a very high false positive rate. Um, I can show something, but I have to s switch over to my screen whenever you... But once we do it, you can do, when you do your presentation, probably you can show that. You have that fake news. Well, my presentation is different. I can't really... Um, but 
the question is, even though when intuitively when you look at it, you see that there is an elevation, there is a, a different kind of a pattern, there is a changes. Why is bad D still showing as a perfect uh, value? Even I mean, I'm, I'm not saying just the pentagram. Even this shows is everything is perfect. Even the cirrus. Because from a shape analysis, it is. Oh, okay, he put. So I want to go over. Let me just actually flip to a different picture for a second, and then we'll go back to to this one. Can you put that also there? So, how many of you would do refractive surgery on the, on that map? Okay, how many would do refractive surgery on this map, which looks like completely normal? This is the exact same shape. Okay, this is a, I'll, I'll go over this later in a talk. This is an aspheric, astigmatic test object where we induce a little degree of tilt. That's why you can't look at curvature. Curvature does not depict shape. And we're, we're so ingrained to look at a curvature map and think we're looking at shape. You're not, you're looking at curvature. Just like if you have a spectacle lens, if you have an astigmatic pair of glasses, and you tilt the glass, what happens to, to the power, the effective power? It changes, okay? Because it's not a shape analysis. So that eye on the right would be off the scale on the asymmetry index, on the uh, TKC would be abnormal, but it's the same shape as the one on the left. Yes, but now, the patient's looking down. Well, right. this is an, this is a, an exact, this is a test object, but you can do the same thing with angle kappa. Well, when the visual well, axis, the apex aren't aligned, you right, get but, abnormalities on curvature. But you can generally see that in the raw images of the machine if the patient's not looking. Well, not looking down, but if someone's visual axis and apex don't align, which is very common, the same thing will occur. But how do you check that? Whether this because is on an this elevation, that's why I said the elevation map will look the same other than it's displaced. So in other words, if I'm looking at you head on, if you turn a little bit, I can still recognize you. On a curvature map, you would look different. But how do you pick it up on this? How do you know this is, uh, this is just a displaced apex, not a pellucid? On this okay, one. Okay, I'll, I'll show pellucid, but um, again, you're looking at a normal elevation pattern that's been displaced. And you can pick that up. It looks like someone's pulled it up but the pattern doesn't show uh, positive, air, air, positive islands of elevation. And the problem with, not a problem, you can use any reference surface. It doesn't matter if you use a sphere, a, an ellipsoid, a toric ellipsoid. What matters though is if you change the reference surface, you change the normal values. And the reason we use a sphere is strictly for um, ease of visual inspection. So these are, and again, you, you can choose what reference surface you want to use. So these are spheres versus torque ellipsoid. And if you notice how easy it is, uh, my point is not showing, but notice on the up, upper right of the first map how easy it is to pick up that positive iron lift elevation. And when you use a torque ellipsoid, it's smaller. If you look at the next thing, exactly the same. If you think about it, if you're looking for an, a cone, you don't compare it to a cone. If you're looking for a red balloon, you don't put it in a room painted red. So there are people who argue to use a toric surface, a toric ellipsoid, a best for toric, and that's good from an optical property, and you're correct. It's more of, it's, it's kind of equivalent of someone's irregularity map. It's more of an optical. But from a shape an analysis, it will tend to mask the cone. And that you, that's exactly what you'd expect. Um, if you fit a contact lens on a keratoconic, you fit a toric contact lens, one that more mimics the cone. But if I want to accentuate and visually in, be able to tell the cone exists, I want to compare it to some surface that accentuates it. And I always use the an, uh, analogy of a map of the Earth. We all are used to looking at maps of the Earth with sea level. Sea level is not a best fit surface, right? Mount Everest is almost 30,000 feet. If we did a best fit surface, we would, we would average the sea, the land, and the mountains, and Mount Everest would be much lower. And if we used a surface that mimicked Mount Everest, it would even be lower yet. 
So I want to make something that visually allows us to do a very rapid inspection. I want to accentuate the pathology, not fit to the pathology. In this case, do you feel that you want to look for anything else, like an abrasion map? Do you feel that this abrasion, can you just place the abrasion map, please? Yeah, <coughs> that's what I said. Uh, the abrasion, you have, uh, I think, I can't, I can't see the center one. Is there a coma there, bone? What is the number there? 094, is it? Do you think, is that a high number for you? If the patient has a higher level of corneal coma in that kind of a suspicious thing, do you put, do you give any importance to it? I do not routinely use the, those generated from, from the Penacam. So I wouldn't want to give you really a, a clinical decision based, based on that. That I'm, I use more what we use on our laser because that's what our laser uses. So, uh, do you use the, the new indices from, uh, from the Corvus, the TBI and CBI? Do you use? I don't, no. You don't. So for example, if this patient has the Corvus abnormality. What do you do on this? Okay, still so as much as people think I'm aligned with Oculus, I'm with Brad, I'm, I'm unconvinced at the moment of the clinical, great research tool of the clinical applicability. I've looked at the TBI against some of my patient populations. I don't have a Corvus, but I was able to get the software and I, I was able to interpret a bunch of patients. It did not, it, having something that is able to separate two populations statistically is different than actually adding to what we already have and um, I did not find it to be clinically advantageous. Um, so um, <clears throat> there, there are two quick points, um, three I guess, I agree, <laughs> that's one. <laughs> two is <clears throat> that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the anterior curvature map the, the pattern you have, um, you can already anticipate what the high order aberration map and what the topometric map are going to look like. So the indices uh, j just tell you what you have already seen. Correct. Um, the, the, the two questions, I guess, here are, you know, can, is this a, nor a, a normal enough cornea uh, to do surgery? But, but the other reality is, um, do you have enough things giving you concern? I mean, we're, we're not talking about should we or should we not do angioplasty. We're talking about should we or should we not correct myopia. So um, that's why for me age did matter, but also I, I think, you know, on these sort of borderline cases, you, you, uh, you need to be cautious and, and, <clears throat> and understand your own level of risk and the patient's own level of risk. Dr. Ramurthy, sir, did you, no, just but to, this patient, if you have specific, this patient, what actually would you Actually, I have not been seeing it right from the beginning, but just to add on to do, what Dr. Bellin said, our own experience with COVID has been also quite unequivocal. We have been using it for almost the last couple of years. Initially, very excited, but especially in the former first year cases where you really put the machine to test, we find that sometimes the TBI index is quite normal in the so-called normal eye. Well, there's established keratoconus in the fellow eye, while there are cases where the CBA is normal and TBA is uh, extremely ab uh, absolute to the red. So though it's a useful tool to analyze, I'm finding it uh, more and more difficult to base my decisions for treatment purely and based uh, on these plus minus those cases. Those cases where develop ectasia, they were always normal. That's right. It, I think Gitanksha is uh, presenting that. Yeah, we uh, should today. be showing those cases. Yeah. So if you get this topography, it's there. Uh, and looking at this, and nest, I, I think you came late. The next slide is just with the baddie uh, image also. Now, how old was this patient? Question you said? Oh, okay. What would you do for this patient? Because the reason this this topography is very important. This is this is a representative topography of your indices uh, all being normal, but when you look at it, you feel that there is something abnormal. 
Now, uh, that's what I asked Professor Mike, uh, Bellin about so it. What do we do? It's a good thickness, 560. It's a minus 3, 20, let's assume the patient age is 28 years. And let's say it's 3. So, yeah, that's what he said, you know. I think, uh, except for the slight doubt in the posterior elevation, everything else looks uh, quite normal, including all the uh, the overall D, all the other factors. And uh, you say minus 3 and 28 years. You might go ahead and do a PRK on this patient. Okay. I, I can make it look better if I just change the colors and change the scale. So, I mean, don't – that's one of the things. You know, it's, but the other thing is we asked about the age, and Brad mentioned age also. Um, Oculus is unfortunately very slow in releasing updates on things that I've asked, but we have an age-adjusted final D, um, which I normally have different numbers for age, but just if someone wants to write this down, basically we use 30 to 31 as the zero point, and we subtract 0 0.05 per year over 31, and we add 0 0.05 per year under 30. Up until about 18, we have no data really below that, or really below 20. So it is an, it, clearly we don't use just a single number. We look at obviously depth, age, family history, asymmetry between the two eyes, but we do have an age adjustment that we do clinically. The, the reason I put this up is it's just not the pentagram which is doing the same thing. If you look at the cirrus here, and cirrus also says the same thing. If you go to uh, if you go to the refractive indices, all of them are well within normal limits. So, so normal. looking at this, I think uh, I, we should. I think we should agree. I don't know. It may be still debated that what you are looking at and what the indices are not matching. I probably we will never know until unless we do something more deeper, uh, like a brilliant like uh, testing to see what is really happening. Can you show us the other eye? Uh, can you show the other eye? Just always, I'll, I normally, you know, we never. It doesn't matter. I'll just hold on. This is okay. Okay, so that's, again, show, show the bad on, bad on that one. Bad. Point okay. 0.86. Now go, go back to the one you just showed that looked really ab abnormal. And now put your cursor over on the color scale on the far right on the far right, no, on the uh, elevation, on the elevation. Switch from American to some stupid scale with my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. That's the problem with, you can make anything look normal or anything look abnormal, okay? So you gotta, regardless of what you do, whatever machine you have, Pick a scale, pick a, a color pattern, and keep it, because otherwise you'll never be able to do rapid. Otherwise, you have to look at numbers, and numbers are time consuming. Can, uh, can we just, go yeah. back to the abrometry map? Abrometry map, please. So, so it, Dr. Cordelia has done a lot of work till they're getting this ready. You have done a lot of work on the uh, new scoring system with uh, Randleman. In Pentacam, what do you think was the most important uh, uh, point which you feel that when you looked at it retrospectively, was the most important point you feel was, was the one which was most common in all the patients who developed uh, ectasia? You can use the cursor here if you want to find that uh, thing or you can just mention it here. Actually, the study that we did, uh, we looked at using the op scan rather than the pentacam. Oh, you did the op scan? Yes, it was with the op scan. But and none of them had a pentacam? No, none of them had a pentacam and um, it was mainly looking at axial maps because Brad's uh, ERSS classification, uh, the scoring was based on a placido or axial map analysis. One question I want to ask is, how many of those patients in your group retrospectively who developed ectasia did have only post elevation like this and nothing? Did any of your patients have only post elevation, but they developed ectasia uh, in your scoring system? None. No, none of them. So 
based on that you think that only post elevation you have is is a factor uh, a major factor in your scoring system i think posterior elevation is something we must always look out for because um um, the textbooks tell us that in early keratoconus, that's where the earliest changes uh, develop. However, um, I think... Is there evidence that having just the posterior elevation only... I mean, you made the random score, there was no topographic criteria in that. But do you think that if you want to make it a new one again, do, will you think that posterior elevation should be part of a thing? Because the question we get always, a uh, lot of time, is not about the topography which is like this about sometimes just have an elevation do or not to do well so we've actually looked at a large uh, database of ectasia patients with the penicam and have not found I any of the <coughs> posterior indices to be abnormal but the first thing I put out there <coughs> is well two things the first thing is don't believe necessarily what you read in textbooks, unfortunately. We all grow up with that, but textbooks tend to be the least peer-reviewed thing in terms of any literature source available, unfortunately. But the second thing is, why would keratoconus present on the posterior surface first? I mean, just if we don't know, if, if we were just taking a step back and say, where would keratoconus present? Why would it present in the posterior portion of the cornea first? The posterior portion of everyone's normal cornea in here is a sponge. It has almost no biomechanical integrity. And left to itself, it has very little shape. The fibers are further apart. The orientation is different. All of the integrity in our normal corneas is in the anterior portion of the cornea. The pathological breakdown <clears throat> in looking at collagen is in the anterior portion of the cornea when with the bridging fibers that are lost in keratoconus. So I don't think we should ever assume that going in. Uh, 